Good afternoon once again. Uh, I've been introduced as Leke, maybe simply as Leke because the surname might be jaw-breaking for you guys. It's my first time in, uh, in Europe, actually my first time out of Africa, and I see it as a privilege to be here this time. I, I, I'm a young scholar, imagine, as you can see. Uh, I teach political science at the Redemash University. The Redemash University is a university, is a faith-based university. It's one of the new things happening in Africa where faith organizations go around establishing universities to promote their faith and then to teach. All right? I'll be presenting on Towards Vision 2020, the utility of cultural diplomacy in achieving integration in West Africa. All right, am um, I just walk on? No, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm looking at if I should go through the abstract because this is not a, okay. Uh, regional integration as we have been told by scholars is one of the most appropriate ways of accelerating development around the world. And that's why you have organizations like the UN, organizations like African Union, like EU, like ECOWAS, which I'll be speaking on. That's why they have come out to say, it's better we unite than we disperse in order to promote development. So in 2007, June, a vision, what they call Vision 2020, was, uh, was come up with to help West Africa integrate the more. Uh, you would understand that integration in West Africa didn't start in that 2007. started way back far as 1975 when the Treaty of Lagos was signed to establish ECOWAS. But over the time, it was discovered that integration is elusive. We've not been achieving what we want to. So to properly integrate now, let's look at how we can utilize uh, what I have now discovered to be cultural diplomacy in achieving integration. I'll be using a theoretical framework called liberal internationalism, yes, which talks about how we can cooperate within the uh, global economy to see what integration holds for all of us. And we'll be, I, I hope to, uh, at the end, uh, be able to achieve the, the fact that cultural integration or cultural diplomacy is also going to be helpful in achieving integration in the sub-region where I come from. All right? I've spoken on this in the, body, in, in the abstract. To achieve peace and sustainable peace, as we now uh, uh, clamor for in the world, there is the need for regional integration. Blocks within regions around the world need to come together to unite, to pull strength together to achieve development. And we believe that regional integration can stimulate peace, all right? And by stimulating peace, development can also ensue from that, all right? West Africa, being in that setup, established ECOWAS. ECOWAS stands for Economic Community of West African States. It was established on the 28th of, June, of May 1975 with uh, 15 original members, 15 pioneer members. And, but over the time, that figure has changed. Okay? This is the map of West Africa. Sorry, I, I don't have the map of Africa. I would have shown you where it is, but thank God we have the map of Africa here. It's just, it's just around here. It's just around here. That's where the West Africa region is. As you can see, we have the powerhouse there. Sorry, Francis. Nigeria is the powerhouse. You agree on that? Yeah, yeah Nigeria is the powerhouse. Then we have Ghana, we have Mali, and all other countries. But let me quickly add that of the 15 original countries, Mauritius pulled out in 19, uh, 1999 owing to what I describe as uh, uh, ideological differences. Ideological differences, I mean, you know, integration will see you part with some of your things 
and incorporate some of the new things they're bringing on. Something like the common currency, something like a United uh, Army and all that. Mauritius, uh, Mauritius was not comfortable with that, so it pulled out in 1999, though it's still on the fringes, all right, wanting to come back. Then we have Cape Verde. Cape Verde joined a year after establishment in 1976, and currently they enjoying the, uh, the union. And I should add that, and as some of us will know, that a country outside the sub-region is also aiming to join. That's Morocco. Morocco wants to join the ECOWAS, and you imagine why would a country outside the sub-region willing to, because they know the power of integration, they know that when you come together, you, 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 you have a larger trading platform, first of all, you have a larger audience, and it, it, it's a way of promoting what you do. So long and short, integration is the way to go in the current world system. What, is the, what are the objectives of ECOWAS? It's just to promote economic integration across the sub-region, and this is hoped to do by creating a single large trading block and building a full economic and trading union, thereby attaining collective self-sufficiency for its members. So that's what it wants to do. Ultimately, what ECOWAS wants to achieve is similar to what EU is doing, all right? create a region where the people are from different countries, but yet are seen as one. We move from one place to the other. Currently in West Africa, we have been able to achieve that. We have what we call the visa-free trans uh, transit from one country to the other within West Africa. All right. Uh, we have what we call an ECOWAS passport. This is a Nigerian passport, but an ECOWAS passport. So, so with this, you can move around the West African sub-region, okay? And we are now looking at a common currency. And we don't know how that was, that was going to work out, but we are going to discuss how cultural diplomacy is going to help out in doing that. All right? So I've said this. Yeah. All right. However, we've seen that even after achieving this much, at integration, there's still a lot to be done in the area of economic development, all right, and integration. The sub-region has been described as being in a precarious state, all right? And this is not just a description of the outside world. Even the organization itself alluded to this in one of its publications in 2010. 75% of West African states are classified by the UN as among the world's least developed countries. The 15 states comprising ECOWAS, which is the subject of this paper, account for 35% of Africa's LC, uh, LDCs, making West Africa the pre uh, preeminent LCD region, not only in Africa, but also in the world. So this is precarious for West Africa, one of the least developed uh, regions in the world. And I, that's why I think integration is much more important for the people of West Africa. Because if we fail to integrate, we are still the least develop, uh, among the least, development, uh, least developing countries now. Maybe uh, at, at the end of the decade or at the end of the century, I jokingly state that perhaps we might be the not to be developed region in the world. But I, I pray we don't get there. But I think we need to integrate if we need uh, to develop. In addition to the above unpleasant reflections of the region, the region also had inadvertently neglected achieving uh, economic integration, and this has resulted in high cost of doing business. All right, that's why companies, some countries, companies come into Africa, West Africa, for example, and over a period of short time they leave. Why? Because there is this high rate of high cost of doing business. They can't just break even at that piece, all right? There is also infrastructural inadequacies, and uh, you guys are really enjoying here in this side of the world, but when I, where I come from, infrastructures are a prayer point. You know what a prayer point is? <coughs> you need to pray to God to have electricity. You need to pray to God to have water, but here you don't need to pray to God to have that. You have that at your fingertips. But far back at home, though the government is doing so much about it, but it's still somehow elusive. Then we have fragile political fusions. ECOWAS, AU, they are still very fragile. They are not as strong as they need to be. Then there is the absence of 
uh, a deep regional integration and uh, reg uh, uh, human trafficking also. So Vision 2020 came about in 20, uh, June 20, 2007, and it declared departure from what originally the 1975 vision was. This time, it wants to set a clear direction and a goal to significantly raise the standard of living of the people through conscious and inclusive programs that will guarantee a bright future for West Africa and shape the destiny of Africa. Previously, it was not, that was not the concern. The concern was just integration. What would integration achieve? But now they are looking at how integration can achieve inclusiveness of the people, all right, and how the destiny of the region together as a people can be achieved. And we said this is a transition from what used to be the echoes of state. What we used to have prior to 2007, when the vision was adopted, was what they have, been, they have described as the echoes of state. It's just the government working together at integration. But what we have from 2010 upwards is what we have described as the echoes of the people. They've seen the relevance of the people in achieving integration. And that's why, it, uh, to me, it, it, it's a watershed, it's a landmark innovation when it comes to integration in West Africa. So this paper aims to explore the utility of cultural diplomacy in achieving the objectives of ECOWAS Vision 2020. And it, it argues that uh, cultural diplomacy, which believes in the use of elements such as heart, believes that the customs of the people to foster mutual understanding between and among states can be utilized to accelerate uh, development within the region. The substance of cultural diplomacy, I almost skipped this aspect because I know I'm coming to the home of cultural diplomacy. So I thought I was going to learn about cultural diplomacy, but I was surprised Mohammed wanted to know more even. So I think I, I should also learn to, uh, to just give a piece of what I think I know about it. Diplomacy in itself is how governments uh, uh, relate with other governments, all right? In the simple parlance, how governments relate with, the other government, with other governments, all right? And what they pursue is what they call the foreign policy. So foreign policy is the what, as I've learned, then diplomacy is the how, how it is pursued. Cultural diplomacy itself is commonly defined as the exchange of ideas, information, art, and other aspects of culture among nations in order to foster mutual understanding. So that's the goal. The goal of uh, interaction of deploying cultural diplomacy is to fo uh, foster mutual understanding, all right? Uh, it's, it has also been described as soft power, all right? Uh, you know, what, what, what we now call soft power is the opposite of the, the mainstream power of using military might of using uh, the strength of a nation to conquer and to achieve your goal. But now we say, no, we don't use, you don't need to use uh, military might to achieve your goal. You can use alternative methods in achieving your goal, and that's what cultural diplomacy is wanting to do. All right, so we say, historically, this is an aspect of history. It, it does not cover all of history. Uh, it's been said that it came about around the late 19th century, <laughs> Uh, at the defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War and all, all of that. So in a bid to rebuild its national image, friend, uh, France came up with strategies at restoring its image and they chose to use cultural diplomacy, teaching of their languages through literature and all of other means. And other countries also have come up to doing such. All right, you know, Germany also does that through how is this pronounced? Good Goethe, is it Goethe, Goethe Institute? All right. Then Britain, Britain also does it through the British Council. All right. The United States through its defunct uh, USIS. All right. All of these countries also want to promote uh, their culture using this means. But there is a slight problem here. I, I think Adam said that, and uh, Christiana asked the question, and I think. It's a big problem. How are we sure that relating to Africans in this aspect of cultural diplomacy, is it rightly perceived? Is cultural diplomacy rightly perceived by Africans? Are they not seeing it as, as she said, another form of colonialism, of colonialization? Because that's going to be a big problem. Look at what a school of thought say. 
they say cultural diplomacy is perceived as in as neo colonialization the americanization or westernization that has emerged after the world war or the cold war in other words it's not a good reception of cultural diplomacy they think it's one of the ways by which europeans and the western states want to recolonize the african continent and i think that's that's I don't know if that's a misrepresentation or it's a correct observation, but we are going to find out in our discussions afterwards. Is the subtle means of using military, economic, and technological hegemony of, of the Western powers. So they see examples of the full bright educational exchange programs of the US as hegemony. All right? So you want us to believe that your ways are the best. You want us to believe that your schools of thought are the superior ones. And Africans are saying, no, such must be rejected. Proudly, Cloud uh, Ake, Cloud Ake is, was a foremost uh, scholar in this regard. So Africa's involvement in cultural development, you observe, is very low. And this is based on the perception of Africans about cultural diplomacy. But I think we can do a form of enlightenment trying to Bring, if truly the agenda is right, we can bring Africa on board to on, on board with cultural diplomacy. La, the theoretical underpinning, as I said, is liberal institutionalism, a strand of the larger uh, liberalism, which is the, uh, the most accepted uh, alternative to realism. Realism, you know, talks about uh, the three S, the three S I say it, uh, the state, the status, and, and sovereignty or something like that, all right? And it, it's just about the state, the state survival and status. It's all about the state. But liberal institutionalism talks about how states can now relate, evolve, cooperate to achieve their goals. And I think that's, that's the right perspective to go. And this has led to the emergence of what we call intergovernmental organization, IGOs, such as the UN, uh, European Union, ECOWAS. It is on the basis of this that cooperation has been reached to solve world's problems. You know, uh, there are so common problems we share, and until we unite to solve those problems, wanting to solve the problems individually might not work. So we need to integrate to solve the problems together. What are the challenges of this region in this sub-region, first of all, before we then move on to how cultural diplomacy can help at that? Uh, the challenges of uh, integration in Africa is, uh, is large, and basically it is hinged on the fact that governments in Africa have refused to admit certain underlying factors. What are these factors African governments have refused to admit? The first is that that unequal gains and losses could result from integration. And that's pure, that's simple. You lose some, you win some when you want to integrate, all right? The refusal of government also to terminate economic ties with non-members. You know, when you say you are integrating, then it must be you and you. Then the reality that high cost of consumption could accrue from trading with high cost member states and all that. Because you are integrating, the rate at which you are getting things within your region might be higher than what you do outside, but because you integrating, you have to adjust to the system. So the sub region, in the sub region, in integration, as we have said, has been elusive over the years from 1975 till now. Integration has not been achieved, and the challenges that has in that integration include or follow from the political to the social to the economic to technological and infrastructure. I think we mentioned that earlier. But foremost is the lack of formulation of effective policies that has become visible in nearly non-existent uh, economic and political interdependence. So the major challenge in the West Africa's integration effort is the absence of effective policies by the African or by the West African governments. And this, this is a real uh, minus for the uh, pursuit of integration. 
Other challenges of the sub-region sub at integrating include the twin problems or the twin challenge of limited resource and unrealistic goals. Africa is a continent blessed as we know, but the, uh, the resources have not been translated to what can be used to, to, to pursue the goals of the continent. Yet we have very ambitious goals, all right? The goals of single currency, the goals of uh, uh, building a gas line from Nigeria to say Egypt or all that, very ambitious, but limited resources to pursue that. So this is a very, very big challenge. Then we have the non-inclusiveness of the vast network of people and societies. And I think that's what cultural diplomacy is all about. You want to integrate people, or you want to integrate states without the people. It's not possible. You need to use the people to integrate the states, not integrate the state with the people, no. You use the people to integrate the state. And I think that's very important. Then I think one of the foremost problems is the inability of member states to subordinate to subordinate their national interest for the larger regional interest, all right? You have your own national interest, and there is a higher uh, regional interest, but you don't want to subordinate your national interest to regional interest. Then integration will be elusive if that's how we go about it. And th th these have been the, uh, the challenges of integration. Then what Vision 2020 all about, and how does it apply to cultural diplomacy? By the way, Vision 2020 is just about three years to, to be realized, and I don't know how far we've gone at that. Just like the MDGs came and went 2015, then we have moved to SDGs, and after SDGs, I know there are still so many alphabet after S. So we might go to MD, uh, QDG, YDG, finally ZDG. So by 20 or 3,300, we'll achieve all of that. Just kidding, though. But I'm saying 2020 is just by the corner. How well have we gone at integrating the West African subregion on the terms of which we, are, we want it to be integrated? It's because we know that the birth of the 2020 vision was in upon the realization that past efforts had failed because it uh, prevented the people from coming together as agents, looking at the government. But now, what we now call the echoes of people is the new framework and it's a renewed call at achieving integration using the bottom-up model. You know the bottom-up model using the people up to the government and the state, not top-down, top using the state down to the people. So we want to use the people to drive integration at this point. All right, so at the end of integration, what is to be achieved? Multilingualism, single market, social economic growth and development, investment in education, training and the youth, multiculturalism, tolerance and respect for human rights, vibrant civil society, mutual responsibility and accountability, interest in community affairs, and positive image. Very important and interesting goals. But to what extent have we been able to achieve this? <clears throat> then the vision itself is built on five transformational building blocks of integrative development, five of such. It's, it's on this basis that I now want to try and see how far cultural diplomacy can help achieve this. So we have regional resource development, peace and security, governance, economic and monetary integration, and private sector growth. Uh, Rosie rightly said that in this area of uh, cultural diplomacy, is the area of, pri of the private sector, is the area of uh, NGOs, not necessarily the government. The government can only come in as regulators at what is happening. The people must drive the process. All right, so I want to pick these building blocks one after the other and dream, propose on what I think cultural diplomacy can do in achieving each of these. So I start by resource regional research development. The dream is that by 2020, there is echo as now, an inclusive society is achieved through human capital development and empowerment, offering a peaceful and healthy environment where women, children, and youth thrive and have equal opportunities to excel and have equi uh, equitable access to resources for human and social development. 
All right. So what do I think can be done? I think cultural independence can come in by engaging the private sector, the real drivers of development, while the government really play a regulatory role. You know, in Africa, governments want to do everything, but it's impossible for governments to do everything. Governments need to put in what we call the, 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 the right environment, create the right environment for the ordinary people to thrive, for the private sector to do what they need to do. So I think we need to go back to that. Then peace and security, and this, has, this is one of the great challenges of the sub-region. I know you have, you've heard of the Boko Haram insurgency and so many of the militants in the south-south of Nigeria, so many other crises around the region. But how can cultural diplomacy achieve peace and security? And I'm addressing it from three, uh, three areas, looking at the threats. What are the threats? Because if you don't treat the threats and you solve the problems at the edge, you always come back to do the same issues. So I, I, I'm thinking conflict or the threats to peace are, three, are threefold. They are religious, political, and social, economic. All right. You know in Africa, religion is very, very important. And people have, uh, have, 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 have gone over the line to pursue the interest of their religion, being fanatical, wanting other people to join their feet, even against their will. So I think we can promote intra and interreligious harmonious interrelationship. And uh, Nigeria is already doing that. We have the in Interfaith Peace Council or something. We're trying to see how we can bring all people of faith together to preach peace to, to, the follow, to their followers. And by that, we can promote in, uh, peace, world peace. OK? Sorry. All right. The political aspect of it can be achieved by promoting uh, political tolerance through the heart, arts like the drama, the, the theater, uh, so many other means uh, can be used to promote uh, uh, peaceful coexistence, talking at, at the political level now. And most importantly, I feel the youth can be post, uh, productively engaged in cultural activities. Uh, in Africa, we have, we, we have majored on uh, natural resources as the mainstay of our economy. Like, for example, in Nigeria, oil has been the mainstay over the years, and now the government is rethinking how can we diversify our economy and looking at tourism, looking at some aspects of uh, culture, the Nollywood, what we call the Nollywood, the entertainment industry. So youth can be engaged in some of these ventures to earn uh, uh, a living from it. And that, my own idea is that uh, it can be an alternative way to display their creativity. Because if you properly engage the youth, I know uh, the big politicians who engage them in violence will not be able to engage them again. They will, they will have a, uh, a, a, a uh, something they do for a living. And it's because they, they don't have something they do for a living, that's why politicians can engage them in those kind of activities they do. And social economic factors, I singled out unemployment. It's very high in Africa. The government is doing its most, but you know the government cannot employ everybody. It goes down to the private sector. So un unemployment is huge, and it's a bridge on our peace and security within the sub-region. And that's why you see people trafficking humans across the border, dangerous uh, travels. And uh, we think that uh, the youth and the people can be productively engaged. Uh, they can earn a living from, from other acts. If employment is generated, for example, they can be uh, sustained by that and avoid uh, crisis. Then what of governance? Uh, there's this clamor for good governance all over the world. But what is good governance? Good governance is governance when you see one. You know, someone was trying to describe what terrorism is all about. And said, terrorism is when you see one. All right? You, you don't know terrorism until you see a terrorist. You don't know good governance until you see it at work. All right? So when you see good governance, there's what I, I have developed to be good governance peer review strategies. All right? I see a country doing well. 
how have you been doing it? I copy it, I adapt it to my system and see if it works for me. All right, so the West African sub-region can also use that strategy to enhance development so that by the end of the time, almost all of the sub uh, member states would have achieved a bit of integration, good government at that point. It's also a system of knowledge sharing among member states, adopting and adapting good governance practices, maybe outside the region also, because you cannot block off other parts of the world. You can learn from outside your, of your region to see what is happening. And I am aware of Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Mo Ibrahim Foundation is working on that, trying to encourage good government, giving a prize. I, I think for last year, no prize was given because no country uh, got it. So it's very important for us to know that good governance is, very, uh, is a yardstick for integration. All right, then a single unified regional market common currency. I, I think it's, it's a hard challenge when we compare it with European Union that has, uh, that has been for a longer period and is now struggling to, struggling to exist. But we think altogether that cultural diplomacy can be used in, in achieving this. Then the private sector, we have said that is the, uh, uh, is the engine room for development, so we must engage the private sector. It is from the private sector we can then bring integration to pass. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leke. Uh, it, questions and answers. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a lot of information, and uh, I think that we can discuss this for many, many years. <laughs> okay. Um, informative questions for me, just to know, you know, so we will have the former, uh, the old background. Uh, where, uh, where is the budget of the action of the? How does it called? Echo. Echo was. Echo was um, is coming from. Is each uh, country is contributing a budget for okay. that? Is there control of the action? Is there, is there a framework that is legally binding every country? For example, that a member country has to follow A, B, C, D rules, uh, and is there a, a control of that? This is only informative, and then we will continue. Can I take it one after the other? Maybe I, I take yours first before. Your other yeah, of questions. course. Just answer that, and then we can. All right. Uh, you know, Echo was like AU. You know, AU is now partnering with the Chinese government. The new AU secretariat was built by China. Am I correct? Yes. In Addis Ababa. And I think uh, it's. What we are merely saying is that we cannot survive as a people. We need externalities to come on board. I'm not too sure of the budget of ECOWAS, but I'll find out. But I think uh, some external forces might also be engaged in that. And that would also influence what is happening within, within the sub -region. You know, that's one of the areas where some countries also have been, uh, have about challenges in coming together as an institution. Togo, for example, Benin, the, the French-speaking areas of West Africa, because there are three dominant languages, the English, French, and Portuguese. The French-speaking areas, because they, they use what we call the, uh, the, uh, the CEFA, highly connected to, 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 to the franc, uh, there's doubt if they'll be willing to drop that currency and take a uniform currency. And that's because there are some externalities that might be coming to that, and that's a great challenge. I will look, look at that in, in the study. Okay, great. Um, so how does ECOWAS compare to other RECs in terms of its success in regional integration? And I have a second question. How, how much trade does uh, the nations in ECOWAS do with one another compared uh, to doing trade with outside of Africa? Because of the level of industrialization, intra-regional or intra-subregional trade is still very low. What the member states of the region need is not readily available within the region. So what do they do? They look outside the region for their sustenance. So intra-regional trade is very low. They still look outside the region for, for, for their 
sustenance. For example, you know, within the EU, you can easily gain employment or across the member states. Uh, you can have uh, a company in Germany producing cars that can be sold in the UK, sold in France, but not like that in, in the sub-region. Uh, you know, it's still uh, it's a developing sub-region, and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not producing as much as the region will need for its sustenance. It's just uh, producing just a bit. Because we know that most of these countries are export dependent. You know that? They're export dependent. They export almost everything they need, but not from the sub-region, from outside. So I think we can look at how we can industrialize so that we can produce what we need rather than exporting them. Or, sorry, importing what we need. Sorry. Thank you very much. I'm Vincent Kalatunga from Uganda. And thank you for the presentation you brought across a number of issues and challenges regarding Africa and cultural diplomacy. One of the greatest challenges in this regard I see for Africa is perception. How Africa is perceived both within itself and its states and countries and cultures and religions, but also from outside. As long as there is a negative perception of Africa, uh, cultural diplomacy is going to be a big challenge for some time. When tribes, nations think that the other nation is inferior than the other, or when there is what we call a superior culture versus an inferior culture, I don't see how far we are going to go in as far as cultural diplomacy is concerned. When Africa is still considered as third world, primitive country, I mean continent, cultural diplomacy is going to be a very, very big challenge. From within, Africa first must create confidence. Confidence between and among nations but nations also among themselves. I use the example of Uganda. When you hear politicians, for example, when you have a political crisis, and politicians come up and say, we have to run to London, we have to run to German or to France to come and solve our own problems, then I think there is a big problem. Africa must learn and appreciate that as a continent, we can solve our own problems. And therefore, once we create that positive perception, then we can easily engage in cultural diplomacy. But this superior and inferior will create inferiority complex or superiority complex and will not allow cultural diplomacy to advance. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think that's true. That's true. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. First of all, yes, I believe that, of course, Africa, if we want to deal with the West, of course, must talk as one voice. But after all, I want to say, how can ECOWAS deal with integration when uh, part of this uh, organization is the Nigeria, it's the problematic country because every day struggle with the uh, weapon market. I appreciate you refer to Boko Haram that, of course, affect the ordinary life in Nigeria. But you know, there are other issues that are very important, such as weapon market and corruption. How can we talk about integration when they obviously influence the ordinary life there? That's thank, why you. We, thank you, Christiana. Christina. Christina, Christina, sorry for that. And that's why we, we mentioned the five integrative blocks. All right, that's what we hope to achieve. You know, it's still a dream. It's not achieved yet. That's what we hope to achieve. And one of those is good governance. Good governance caters for all of those things you mentioned. So we hope to achieve good governance by what I propose, so that at the end of the day, we, might not, we will not have the crisis you're talking about. It will now be easy, seamless, for us to integrate. So I think we are working on that also. Thank you. Okay, last question. Actually, I have two. So make it short. One, okay. Uh, first question, you did say something about uh, the Moroccans, and uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 
the Moroccans opted out of the African Union. So now, or eventually I'm sure they came back, but then if they opted out of the African Union, how do you think they can flourish in, the, in ECOWAS? Like, do you think they can flourish in ECOWAS if accepted to join the, um, um, the ECOWAS? That's my first question. And uh, my second question, is there any room for foreign investors? Because you did say everything, like uh, judging from what you said, all what you mentioned is based on, you know, um, we, yeah, within um, um, Africa, within West Africa, is there any room for foreign investors? Because apparently we can't survive without getting help from outside, you know, other countries. So is there any room for foreign investors? Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, your first question. Morocco, you know, it's not within the sub-region, geographically. And... Uh, uh, temporarily, it has been given a leeway, but has to be affirmed by member states. Uh, I think one of the w things uh, Morocco has seen in the sub-region are the opportunities. If there are no opportunities, you won't want to invest in a block that is not fruitful. And I think they've seen the fruitfulness in ECOWAS, and that's why the state wants to join. And if, at the end, Morocco is accepted as a member state, you can be sure many other states will come on board because our West Africa region is very rich, both in human capital resources and mineral resources. So if Morocco is accepted, many other countries will come on board and together we are sure to build a bigger and better sub-region. Uh, foreign direct investment, definitely. You know, we talked about the, uh, uh, what's it called now? Private sector initiatives, private sector. Part of it is allowing people from outside to come invest because you can, as you said, you, you cannot develop isolatedly. You have to bring in other regions to, to develop. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you for the